controversies surrounding this type since, of course, uh, the Sochi summit and, of course, uh, uh, the uh, misinformation and propaganda targeting uh, Russia and her presence in Africa. Today, we want to draw that line to understand better what it, it's all about, cooperation, and how it is different from interference. And we are taking the Russia-Africa ties as a, a case study, like underlined, uh, uh, the uh, ties between Russia and African countries have been existing for some years now. And of course, the past few years have uh, seen a surge in this relationship. And of course, without taking too much time, I want to introduce uh, the uh, illustrious panel that will, a panel of experts that will give more insight on this very important topic, drawing the line between interference and cooperation as far as Russia, Africa uh, ties or relationships are concerned. I'll be taking you now to the United Kingdom. That's uh, meet uh, Ellis Clinton, who is a uh, geostrategic and of course, uh, electrical, electrical power engineer. Thank you for joining us this day, sir. Thank you very much, Clarice. I'm very happy to be here to participate in another of um, this, these fascinating um, discussions that we normally have whenever we meet up on your fantastic program. So thank you for the invitation, and I'm very honored to be here today. And it's always a pleasure, Mr. Ellis, to know that you are always considered having your views heard on topical issues that affects the African continent, let me call it Mama Africa, as you fondly call it, and of course, how we need to draw the lines between uh, interference and cooperation in uh, this era of multilateralism. And of course, uh, we are going to meet uh, uh, Mr. Patrick Popel, geopolitical analyst, also expert uh, at the uh, Center for Geopolitical Studies in uh, Belgrade. Hello to you, sir, and thanks for joining us on the panel. African television. So thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation because it's important to talk about this um, uh, topic because very important is that Africa has increased than in the past and so I think we must talk about this now to prepare, prepare uh, new ways for the people in Africa. Indeed, very imperative uh, for the people of Africa. We need to strategize, like we underlined in uh, the preamble. There is need uh, for countries to choose and to be tactical with whom the trade at every sphere. And that is why we are here today to draw a line to bring a clearer understanding between the terms interference and cooperation. Without uh, much ado, we're going to proceed straight to the analysis. Just to remind our viewers of that uh, Yulia Burke will be joining us subsequently as we uh, continue with this very important topic. I'll kick off with you, Mr. Elise. We are talking interference and cooperation, taking Russia-Africa relations as our case study. But then before trying to bring the peculiarities uh, that mark this uh, relationship between Russia and the African continent, let's understand the terms interference and how it is different from cooperation and we see how Russia fits in here. Thank you, Clarice. Very, very important question. When I think about interference, I think about interference with regards to the military intervention in Afghanistan. That had um, a UN Security Council, which had unanimous agreement among the international community, including Russia, which gave support um, to the Americans because they saw it important to essentially go after the alleged um, attackers of 9-11. But the issue of Iraq is another story where Saddam Hussein had made certain decisions to ditch the dollar um, and to use the euro. And um, the powers that be could not see this happen. And so, of course, they created, Tony Blair and George Bush created um, the narrative that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. And, you know, went and Colin Powell, if you can remember, went um, to the United States nations um, and he presented a vial a white, with a white substance in it and he put this in front of the international community as evidence that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction 
um, including chemicals and biological weapons, and that it was um, enough for to there to be military intervention. And so they did not receive this um, UN Security Council um, support, and so they decided to act unilaterally. And, um, and so moving on from that, we, we remember Vladimir Putin's speech at the, at the Munich um, Security um, Summit in, in, um, that happened in 2007, and he gave a seminal speech in which he essentially said the world is not safe because there were unilateral actions taking place by the powers that be against international law and therefore international law was no longer a deterrent uh, to imperialism and so he gave the speech in front of merkel in front of extremely important people at the time and uh, essentially what he he came about is, is to conclude that without security, which essentially is that countries are able to exercise their right to self-determination, which we're talking about Article 1 of the UN Security Council, which means that you should not intervene in the internal affairs of the sovereign population or a people unless there is, according to international law, um, if you're a signature of the UN Charter, then the resolutions can be passed in which there can be um, agreements to intervene. However, what was happening was the breakdown of the complete um, structure of multipolarity to creating uh, a new world of, of, of imperialism. And so what we have now happening again is that in the emerging new world in which the dollar is declining, and as a consequence of this, um, the other fiat currency that are backed you know, by the Federal Reserve central banking system out of um, the, the Bank of International Settlement, as that infrastructure collapses, what we're seeing is the emergence of the BRICS. And so now a new form of multipolarity in term and a new architecture is being created. And so this architecture will be built on sovereignty. And the BRICS nation been able to exercise sovereignty um, of their own nation, one with respect to another, without any kind of intervention in the other's internal affairs and you know very sensitive affairs and sensitive matters. And they've been able to increase um, respect among each other to the fact that they have now created a, a, a rather amazing institution that a lot of in other countries now are now applying to join. And so sovereignty in, in multipolarity is at the heart of the new architecture that is currently being devised among the BRICS members, being led, of course, by Russia. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for for that, uh, uh, Mr. Elise. Thank you for the, uh, of course, uh, insight on the two terms of interference in uh, cooperation. And uh, I think, uh, in the same perspective, we're going to get uh, uh, Patrick's uh, on view of uh, cooperation and interference as far as Africa, uh, Russia, Africa ties are concerned. Yes, when we, when we talk about uh, this cooperation, we can also talk about influence. This is interesting. But the influence of Russia or the influence of China is the other way than the uh, US influence is working or the Western influ influence is working. So um, we can see that uh, China is very busy in this economic relation also in Africa. But um, the job of Russia, we can see also now in this uh, defense situation against the West, the job of Russia is not first business or something else. It's to make uh, diplomacy, to connecting different levels, different peoples, different states. I think this is the first role of Russia now, not like the Chinese way of economic relations and also in this way of defense and this is very interesting so uh, you can see uh, um, also the interests of russia to protect different african states against terrorism together with this wagner group so um, i think africa must the people in africa must recognize must 
uh, think about their security against also the Western interests. So I think it is very, it is very, um, very dangerous when you have many resources, but you haven't a good army because you must protect yourself. And so I think, I think Russia will also help uh, different African states to defend themselves, to uh, grow up uh, security structures, to can defend them against people that don't like peace in Africa. Because uh, when you when you see what's happened in the last century in Africa, if the Europeans, not in the, in the past, so this uh, colonial uh, time. So when you only see the 20th century, the second part of the 20th century, you can see who uh, the Europeans are working with Africa. So the, for them, Africa is only a, a, a place for resources and they can get them. So I think we need an, um, different alliances, different uh, uh, treaties between the, between the um, different parts of Africa, also together with Russia, together with China, maybe, uh, to um, protect the resources from this uh, occupation way of the West, because we can see the West is expanding. You can see it in Ukraine, in Europe, yes. You can see it also in the policy against China. And they like to get to the resources of Russia. They like to divide Russia and to get all the resources of Russia, but they haven't an access. And this is the problem. When they have no success in Russia, against Russia, they go to another place and they go uh, to Africa. And they like to have the resources of Africa. And I think so the African people and the Russia, they have um, the same enemy. They have the same situation because they're sitting on the resource and, uh, and they must defend them against this uh, influence from the West. They only need these places to get to the resource. And so I think this will be the way first for a development of relationship between Russia and different African states to stand together uh, against these, um, these possibilities of occupation from the West. This is very important. So I think this relationship will not be only on diplomatic way, with only not only on the way of, uh, trading and, and, and the economical relations. So also on the, on the, on the level of, uh, of uh, uh, relations about security, I think. This is my view about the things and these relations. Yes. for their insight uh, on this uh, topic for discussion uh, this day, uh, which is focused on uh, Russia-Africa ties and uh, drawing lines between interference and cooperation. Like announced earlier that uh, Yulia Burke will be joining us uh, subsequently, of course. She is joining today in a different perspective because she is joining live from uh, Africa Media Studio. And of course, it's with pleasure that I welcome you to Africa Media Media. Welcome to Afric Media, dear Yulia. Thank you. Um, I'm extremely happy to finally be here in the studio, Thank and you. I'm happy to say that um, that I finally reached. So uh, we've been having very intense days uh, here in Cameroon because country has uh, a lot to offer, just like the entire continent. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy to be physically here because I know that we're connected through the uh, information field, but now Absolutely. we're connected yeah. even closer. Absolutely, and uh, it's a pleasure to know that uh, even with your tight schedule, you made it possible to Africa Media, and we are most uh, uh, 
or not to have you this day we are going to just write on with what we are talking about today we are focusing on russia africa relations and of course drawing the line between interference and cooperation you know that with what is happening lately in the global world and of course i talked earlier about the the, the communication war misinformation and propaganda uh, that actually has attacked this relationship uh, between russia and african countries that's why today we want to bring a holistic understanding of what uh, this uh, Russia relation ties Russia Africa relation ties all about drawing the line between cooperation and interference so in your own perspective taking our case study what do you have to see uh, what are the key factors uh, that you think uh, uh, actually define uh, this Russia Africa relationship and then when we talk of this relationship do we talk more of cooperation or interference well, you know, I um, I will answer this question by going back in history a little bit and then sharing some of the um, impl applied impressions that um, I have from uh, my personal experience and experience of my uh, colleagues and friends, right? Yeah. So, well, uh, the role of Russia on the continent has been very different from the role that was played by uh, some of the Western countries that were trying to get the resources, divide and conquer, and that were trying to dominate, keep their dominance, keep things un under control, while we see some uh, constructive uh, aspects of uh, that period of time, especially in, in the southern part of Africa, where at least some basic infrastructure was developed, including roads and railroads and everything else. Uh, here in this region, unfortunately, this is less obvious, and the methods used by the, the, the Western uh, countries before were varying from some extremely harsh ones to just simply abusive ones, right? Yeah. So despite of that, uh, well, the role of Russia has been significantly different because uh, I think one of the key moments when it played its role was uh, in, starting from 50s to 70s where, when the Soviet Union was supporting all of the movements for independence and that formed certain, uh, let's say, partnerships. Uh, but those were more of a tactical partnerships because Absolutely. they were, uh, let's say, partnerships uh, against a common enemy, right? Sure. So um, uh, just now I was traveling across uh, Africa in uh, quite, a, uh, quite an intense journey and I, I've now uh, visited the Republic of South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Morocco, and the trip uh, continues, right? So in Zambia, uh, the feedback that I received from one of the people that we were talking to, and he's a business consultant, mm -hmm. he said that one of the mistakes that was made at that point was that no ties, uh, uh, no business ties were established back in the 70s, right? Absolutely, so yeah. despite of the fact that there was some investment, you know, the struggle, the blood spilled together and everything else, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the results uh, of this were not uh, fixed by neither side. So the partnerships between Russia and African states were not really formed in a way in which it could ensure active cooperation. So now we observe a situation in which Russia doesn't really have any soft power that it mm -hmm. uh, uses to promote itself. If you go out and ask people here in Cameroon about Russia and Russian way of living, people wouldn't have much to say because they don't see films in Russian uh, episodes like serious in Russian, nothing. There is no source of information because Russia is not doing it on its own. Absolutely. That's number one. Number two is that uh, in terms of business cooperation, in most cases it goes uh, up to uh, corporate um, agreements, it goes up to uh, intergovernmental agreements, but at the uh, uh, medium-sized business level or small-sized business level, all depends on specific people and the role, the role of personality in history Absolutely. becomes extremely huge. So over here, what I was seeing in Cameroon and other countries, you know, if uh, businessmen were taking more initiative to reach out to each other to create some joint ventures, mm -hmm. it would have changed the situation a lot. And that's, I think, uh, one of the key differences uh, between the approaches being used and one of the reasons why we don't see that much of cooperation as could have been possible because there are some success cases when Russia uh, when Russia supplies some of the technology, supplies some of the simple, cheap and uh, durable solutions, then Africa uses it here on the continent, it produces its goods and it sells it to Russia. That uh, is valid for agriculture where Russian fertilizers and uh, some of the equipment from Russia, Belarus, is being used here to, you know, to uh, uh, have to harvest, uh, um, you know, the um, 
like the fruits and uh, the agricultural products yeah. and then to send them back to Russia, either raw or processed. So I think there are a lot of co co collaborations that could be possible and this lays uh, the perfect foundations for this kind of uh, uh, this kind of joint uh, ventures and generally speaking cooperation. So in terms of interference, you know, uh, there was some at some point in order to support the movement yeah. uh, for sovereignty, uh, but at the moment interference are just uh, you know some uh, some very modest attempts to uh, establish some ties uh, which sometimes do work out sometimes do not okay okay thank you for that uh, dear Yulia and uh, we are riding on if you are just tuning in uh, this is views on the continent on uh, the pan-african television Afric media we're going to continue with you mr. Elise and now to this question now in what ways could uh, in your own perspective uh, in what ways could Russia's cooperation with Africa, given uh, all you've said and all Mr. Patrick has said and what uh, Yulia just added right now, in what way could Russia's cooperation with Africa contribute to sustainable development and address the continent's uh, pressing socio-economic challenges, especially in uh, the present uh, century? I think um, the most important subject is sovereignty. You know, you if your people have a, a, a desire, an aspiration to get from point A to point B, whether it's socioeconomics or education, health, you know, we have the right as humanity, I believe, to self-determination by God. It is not given to us by an institution um, or an organization. These things are enable, inalienable to us as given to us by God. Unfortunately, when we live under imperialism, what tends to happen is that um, there is, uh, you know, a monarchy or, you know, it could be a technocracy, as in the case of the European Union. What tends to happen is that they think that they can decide the future of the, for the individuals. So they talk about influencing behavior. So if you listen to Larry Fink of BlackRock, or George Soros, you know, of and 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 any of their institutions or think tanks coming out of their school of thought, they believe that they have a right. Klaus Schwab, for example, in his book *The Fourth Industrial Revolution*, where they want to influence behavior through, you know, the the ESG of the UN, and of course, we're you know we're talking about um, connecting the the economics to the so the sociological aspect you know human behavior so we're taking a, things away from it being a meritocratic meritocratic system which is based on the individual having the ability to have the freedom to use their creativity to then decide their future for themselves to a highly technocratic one in which there is a a top-down kind of approach and what russia has to offer is an architecture for protecting your people against this dangerous imperialist agenda um because as a brother patrick said earlier in terms of defense defending your resources you don't stand a chance if you have a pot of gold in your house and the entire world knows you have this pot of gold in your house but your locks are not very safe and you haven't got the armament to protect yourself from intruders because the world is not safe there are many imposters and intruders, people coming, you know, like angels only or, 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 or like sheep, but really they're wolves. So there's the book, Confession of an Economic Hitman, written by, I think, um, uh, I can't remember his name, John Perkins is his name. And he gives essentially the explanation about how it is that um, the CIA or the military industrial complex and all of those institutions tied to, um, you know, the intelligentsia, and of course, back to Switzerland with the central, you know, the Bank of International Settlement, that is essentially the central bank of all central banks and how it goes about proliferating ideas through the UN, through consult consultancies, you know, um, you know, like the Goldman Sachs and all the rest of them, you know, the Mackenzies of this world, right? If you do not have security, you cannot exercise sovereignty. And so what we have is a chicken and the egg situation that you cannot... If you're Africa, you cannot have security because you have no economy and your economy is really based on your ability to have security. And so what Russia can offer really, as I said, is a friendship, a strategic friendship and partnership 
that is absolutely required in order for you to be able to start to exercise sovereignty from inside of your country, um, where you can now elect your own government without intelligentsia coming in and 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 toppling a regime, a regime or rising up essentially, um, you know, a kind of a coup d'état or whatever else. You know, unless the society is secure and your and your and your state is secure, you can really have no. Um, no, no prosperity, and so Russia as a partner can really strategically help in this particular regard. And in closing out, before we, I, I will close for this particular moment. I, I, I need to say that specifically the BRICS, with the BRICS Development Bank, and the ability to settle, um, you know, trade in their local currencies, or in you know, rather than reverting to the dollar or to the the so-called Bretton Woods type, you know, um, you know, reserve currencies. We're not talking about sovereign countries being able to decide for themselves that, yes, I can trade in Naira if I'm Nigerian and, and I have enough confidence, you know, as Russia in the, in the Nigerian economy. Why not take Naira? Why not build this partnership so that you don't have to take the risk in trading on the Forex to speculate? And, and one day it's this and the next day it's that. And so you have no security. So this new architecture that Russia through the BRICS are now helping to then trade through South Africa and, and all of all of that infrastructure is now ready to go. So these are the ways in which Russia can be of assistance. All right, thank you so much for that, Mr. Elise. Uh, in uh, the same light uh, with uh, you, uh, Mr. Patrick, uh, talking about sovereignty, which is uh, vital here. We know if we want to balance uh, uh, the uh, interference and cooperation, there is need uh, to, to actually understand uh, that this comes uh, with a mutual agreed uh, upon principles. And of course, uh, this is uh, where we're talking about Africa, uh, Russia, relationship so now the question is in your own opinion Mr. Patrick what are those factors that African countries can consider uh, when deciding to engage uh, further with Russia because of course the the relationship is already ongoing and of course there is a need to give it another Im uh, impetus so what can be done or what can these uh, stakeholders in Africa consider uh, when engaging with Russia and how does this impact their sovereignty and national interest. I can also fully agree with my uh, our friend colleague from UK, but I must I see also the mistakes in the past of the Russian policy, and I can say that um, Russia must also use more soft power and more uh, um, platforms for connecting the people for have relations in this uh, civil society also. So um, in the in, Russia is not working like like um, like the US policy. The US policy is working in another way. They have many resources for this soft power project, for this uh, propaganda, reclam and all this. Um, but uh, I think now um, Russia is waking up and uh, it's uh, ready to do something else to make good image for his country and for the relations with the other countries. But um, I say it on the beginning so that um, important is the security. And I think in this way, the, um, the important people in Africa, president, defense ministers, ministers for security, they must wake up, they must wake up and they must see this dangerous, what can be happened when this uh, attack against Russia now comes to the end, about the peace treaty or something else, then um, the West will go to Africa because they need the resources. They need the resources, I say it, they need re resources from um, from Russia, and they couldn't get it. This is the problem for these guys. And they go to Africa the next time. So now it's not much time for Africa to build to build this uh, this um, alliance, maybe between the African countries to protect themselves for influence. And this influence will be in the way of regime changes and in different other 
projects of our Western friends or uh, directly uh, occupation, like we have seen in Iraq, Afghanistan, and so, uh, or in Northern Africa. And so it's very important now to create these uh, structures for security in Africa, together with Russia, maybe also together with China. But uh, this is my uh, call to the people to think about this. This is very, very important in the next years. And about the economic development uh, and about all the BRICS and also the interests of China and Africa. So I see no problem because it's already working. So this is my statement. Okay, yeah. Uh, we uh, just want to remind ourselves of that uh, this is Views on the Continent, and we are discussing Russia Africa ties uh, in a, a month of that uh, the Russia and, of course, uh, the African continent is gearing up toward the Russia-Africa summit, the second, uh, to be precise. Coming back to you here in the studio, dear Yulia, I quite mentioned uh, in our first intervention, I, I talked about uh, uh, misinformation and propaganda uh, that has actually uh, been going on trying to tarnish the relationship already existing between Russia and Africa. And now when we talk of interference, uh, some people always uh, have this mindset, like like let's say that the critics will see uh, Russia is involved in, in exploiting uh, weak governance systems or supporting authoritarian regimes in, in Africa. And I think uh, the, the reason for, for for us to elaborate on this uh, topic is to uh, bring things clear to the world, understanding clearly how Africa-Russia intervention is all about and uh, that it is more of a win-win. So in your own perspective, what can you say uh, to this uh, pessimist uh, view or pessimistic views regarding the Africa-Russia uh, ties? Well, in terms of uh, some of the uh, scandals that were coming out, and mostly the Western media and some of the African media that is, uh, you know, financed mostly by the West, of course, they try to show things in a different light, trying to say that, uh, you know, Russia is trying to interfere and this, that, and whatsoever. But if we take a closer look at what kind of, uh, let's say, goals and values are being promoted by those different actions and how it actually happens, we will see the two very different sides of the spectrum, where on one side you have various uh, uh, color revolutions, so-called, and various coup d'etat mm -hmm. uh, being staged and um, you know, it's not even being denied much. They're being staged and carried out by Western security services and agents of influence and whatsoever else. And those try to create controlled chaos. Those try to, uh, you know, create this kind of a situation again of divide and conquer and, you know, uh, this uh, chaotic, uh, uh, chaotic situation that then they uh, twist under, you know, their control. On the other side of the spectrum, even with the uh, uh, with what's being discussed, uh, you know, part of uh, part of which could be, you know, rumors or scandals or whatever else, but we see that in most cases it's all about the uh, support of uh, existing regimes, and that implies stability, that implies development. So um, it's very hard to come up with an example of a revolution that led to uh, well, there are no examples of immediate outcomes or immediate improvements after any revolution, but even if we look at the uh, long run, in most cases it's not really uh, you know a stable way or a sustainable way uh, to provide certain changes, right? So any country, in order to be strategic uh, in its projects and policies, needs uh, certain stability and predictability, right? So if you're a government formed for only four years, and even if you want to implement a simple infrastructure project, let's say roads or you know energy sector, whatever else, uh, that timing is definitely not enough to plan for you know. Um, for strategic issues, not to mention like generations ahead. And this is when you have uh, things like deep state kicking in and controlling the actual strategies. Mm -hmm. So that's the uh, that's the trap. Uh, that's, um, you know, point one. And point two is that uh, if uh, um, Africa reaches out to other partners, to, well, any partners, let's say, right, for mm -hmm. uh, China, for the goods and uh, finance and resources, for India, for partnerships in specific areas or 
uh, if uh, African countries reach out to Russia for uh, some of the uh, simple technology or basic infrastructure or security or whatsoever else, in order to improve uh, life and develop, uh, you know, various areas on the continent. So that is a uh, natural right that those countries are supposed to have to reach out to different partners and pick and decide, okay, you come here and let's build infrastructure together. You come here, let's ensure security. Mm -hmm. uh, those are absolutely logical and natural things that sometimes are presented as some kind of scandals, which sure. uh, in the core <laughs> cannot be so. Absolutely, yeah, which is very imperative uh, uh, to bring uh, clarity to, to all of these uh, uh, in the moment of high uh, geopolitical tension and also uh, multilateralism, uh, like we underlined earlier on, uh, the fact that uh, uh, some parts are losing grip on Africa, it's becoming tumultuous for Africa itself, and that is why it is imperative for stakeholders, government stakeholders, even the private sector, uh, to be tactical and, of course, intentional about how and why they engage in uh, in every uh, cooperation with whatsoever uh, they are engaging uh, uh, with regarding uh, uh, this uh, international cooperation in contemporary uh, society. Uh, uh, let, let me continue with you, dear Yulia before we're going to meet uh, uh, Mr. Elise and uh, Mr. Patrick. Now, you've, you've had a tour in some African countries, uh, and of course you are here today in uh, Douala, Cameroon, and that's why we are here you're in the studio with, with us uh, on Africa Media. Uh, what have you observed so far as far as uh, partnership between African countries and uh, other countries are because you must have visited some uh, uh, higher institutes of learning, you have visited companies. Uh, is Russia really engaged in the aspect of trade or is there a lot that still needs to be done as they're trying to, to build a strong partnership which actually wasn't given priority in the days when Africa was uh, fighting for independence? Well, you know, uh, since there was the uh, the pandemic and all the uh, geopolitical issues and other ones taking place, uh, uh, this time I had a uh, great opportunity to revisit some of the countries that I haven't been to for several years. And let me tell you that I was very uh, surprised uh, to see that uh, time was not wasted here and during the pandemic and right after mm -hmm. um, countries like Zambia and Zimbabwe for instance used that uh, time slot in order to uh, think some infrastructure projects through and actually implement them so a lot of new roads were being built and airports and uh, you know uh, many other um, infrastructure projects were being implemented so now that i came here uh, four years after so before the pandemic was the uh, the last time that i uh, traveled to the southern um, africa yeah. i found the situation very different and uh, you know much better in terms of a lot of new things just uh, coming up so zambia managed to uh, go through a default that kind of renewed the economy now it's a country that represents uh, a very uh, you know a stable partner so it has this uh, almost perfect environment for doing business and uh, what I was noticing you know after this um, uh, period of time that uh, the pandemic actually played a huge role in uh, uh, in making a certain revision because even the way of thinking is changing and I think uh, now many people would uh, you know agree and understand that pandemic was a pre planned activity and you know some of the measures taken during the pandemic were uh, aimed to be more harmful than uh, you know fixing the uh, issues mm -hmm. so I think it uh, played a huge role also in uh, uh, people's understanding of sovereignty people's understanding of uh, you know some of the strategies and tactics being implemented uh, uh, around the globe and of course the current happenings and the uh, ongoing conflict between not even Russia and Ukraine but Russia and NATO, Russia, uh, Russia and the uh, so-called
called what we call the uh, collective West. Yeah. It shows a lot because you know people in uh, Donetsk, for instance, in uh, um, in um, uh, Donetsk People's Republic, they say that we are at the same fight with the neo-colonial uh, uh, world order, and you know they feel that they're at the uh, hot front line right now, but they feel that Africa is somewhere you know close to them, and I have uh, a feeling that many people in Africa observe that happening with Russia and the West, uh, understanding that this is the same war that uh, uh, that is being fought, but we're just uh, in different uh, locations with Absolutely. this, right? Yeah. So that's the uh, that's the feeling. And uh, going back to the issue of uh, cooperation again, I uh, realize more and more each day that uh, uh, a huge role is being played by individuals, right? And the role of personality in history, as we say, uh, is huge. So in some countries, I would hear stories like, uh, you know, if the ambassador was active enough, then businesses would come in and there would have been like joint uh, projects and there are cases like that. Uh, but now I think it's also so, um, you know, a, a question of, uh, you know, just going first and kind of trying to uh, show the uh, the path to everyone else. And of course, the uh, events uh, taking place, uh, you know, in the upcoming couple of months would be playing a huge role. So Absolutely. I expect that, well, Russia-Africa summit uh, um, is a very important one, but, uh, you know, uh, the, the expectations from this one in the given circumstances are not extremely high, but I think some major statements will be made uh, at the BRICS summit that will be attended by heads of states uh, uh, of uh, not just of the uh, BRICS countries, but much more. And I think some, uh, you know, very big announcements would be made uh, during the uh, BRICS summit. And after those two events, when, uh, you know, the communication is already established, there is a clear understanding of what can be done and where and how. Mm -hmm. And then new instruments and new mecha mechanisms uh, kick in, and the balance of power changes a little bit. Then this, uh, you know, would just uh, create a, a quantum leap effect in terms of uh, global politics. Very imperative, uh, dear Yulia. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, talking about uh, BRICS uh, summit, uh, talking about uh, the decisions uh, that are being uh, uh, advanced uh, by BRICS uh, nations. Uh, uh, coming to you, Mr. Patrick, uh, let's look at uh, uh, the aspects of uh, uh, financial independence. Here we want to to analyze uh, uh, this ties uh, because I, I, I mentioned earlier that we want to look at the peculiarities of this Russia Africa relationship. And we know that for years, Africa has been advancing on how it can gain financial independence because uh, this is one thing that has uh, been advanced for why African countries or African economies cannot grow fast because of a uh, uh, lack of financial independence. And now we see the BRICS uh, advocating for this uh, uh, new financial system that will actually uh, come to replace uh, the old, which has actually controlled economies uh, and of course uh, the financial market in, uh, the, uh, in, in the past. So with this new perspectives uh, uh, bringing, uh, uh, that the BRICS uh, and other stakeholders are bringing forth. What do you think uh, these stakeholders, especially from Africa, can do as they work in collaboration uh, with uh, their international partners uh, towards uh, this uh, uh, financial independence? So this uh, beginning of this BRICS movement, after the beginning of this BRICS movement, um, the door of the world is open for Africa. So, in the beginning, uh, South Africa joined this movement or was a founder of them. But uh, now it's a possibility for for many for many um, countries to join this BRICS movement, and this should be a a very good uh, possibility for develop their relations in the economic way and this is the, the biggest change they have because um, now Africa is not isolated from the world before Africa was only uh, was only uh, uh, was a little player 
or not was it wasn't the player but now it's integrated it's integrated in a system of different countries all over the world and this brick system is the first step for this uh, real independence of africa but also for the development of the economy because i'm not the expert for financial things so i'm only for conflicts or something as a security but i like to speak about about this um this war in in financial uh levels yes and we can see that the dollar is going down in its reputation and so we have this uh, possibility to create new financial systems also new markets are now founding so uh, i think this is the the first step for this for this independence of africa and for this development and then one of the biggest um, possibilities is this BRICS movement i think i think this is the uh, this is the best possibility to uh, grow up this independence and also this development in economics and um, yes we are living in a financial in a financial time yes so everything is very close to the to the uh, different money you use yes you can see it also in times of inflation and something else um, but I think it's the best the best way for Africa is that many of them can join the BRICS and also go in different other allies uh, alliances and this should be a possibility to to create this new world uh, against this imperialism of the dollar because it is very dangerous for many Lisa, to be very intentional in, in this uh, world that has become more challenging. Uh, let's continue with you, uh, Mr. Uh, Elisa, of course, uh, uh, while uh, putting in mind uh, that we are analyzing the Russia-Africa ties and, of course, uh, looking at the drawing the line between uh, interference and cooperation, we continue to highlight uh, those uh, very peculiarities or uh, issues uh, that actually define uh, this uh, Russia-Africa ties in uh, the month, uh, like uh, Yulia said earlier on, uh, the uh, leaders and stakeholders from across Africa and Russia will be meeting in the, the in weeks to come to discuss further on how they can uh, make solid uh, these uh, uh, cooperation and of course change the narrative surrounding uh, uh, the, the Russia Africa ties as presented uh, by uh, uh, some uh, uh, some some media uh, organs of course uh, in and uh, out of Africa uh, let's look at the, the Russia's military presence because when we're talking about uh, the cooperation we talk in every uh, sphere in every dimension and we know uh, that uh, security is prime and we can also uh, applaud some of the successes of that have been uh, recorded in Africa so far we, we can talk uh, the Central African Republic we can cite Mali and of course how uh, Russia's involvement in these countries have been or brought a milestone for, for the nations so now let's let's look at uh, uh, Russia's military presence in Africa and how this will impact regional security uh, dynamics and in your perspective what measures should be put in place to ensure uh, uh, better or stronger stability and uh, respect we are coming back to this very element which you love talking about so much respect for sovereignty <laughs> um I think Russia can do a very good job in terms of conflict uh, resolution. You know, when I look at Africa and looking back for so long, we've seen so many internal conflicts. And these internal conflicts are coming, whether tribal or their religious um, conflicts or, you know, you name it. So I think of Russia, I, I can recall back um, in Chechnya, you know, when you had these conflicts, you know, potentially breaking away. But of course, we know that um, it was being sponsored by 
um, external forces like the CIA, um, like MI5, that actually wanted to separate Russia, right, and to break it up so that um, its resources, as our friend Patrick mentioned, could be accessible. And of course, uh, Putin came to power back in 2000 in the wake and, and this biggest challenge that he faced. And he had to find a way of settling this conflict. And of course, they would want to put religious wars because religious wars will then, you know, could, you know, draw blood. And once they draw blood, then they're very difficult for them to be resolved. But then somehow, you, you know, was able to restore um, Chechnya as an, as an, uh, an uh, semi-autonomous um part of of um, russia and with proud russian citizens and the same thing for dagestan but of course you know he built a mosque also in i think in in in, in moscow too in commemoration of the muslim population of russia of course you have the you know the, the russian is a, is essentially led primarily by um the orthodox church and so there is a spiritual element to the country and the spiritual element is natural law, natural law in, in, in terms of the family values. All of those things are important in, if you want to build, you know, a, a healthy community, a healthy state. You know, you, you have to have families. If you look at Western countries, there is a decline in terms of the birth rates because of the moving away from traditional values and, of course, moving towards this LGBTQ movement that does not value the traditional um, family. So Russia has, uh, has stood up um, for its own principles, wake of significant amount of um, propaganda um, of pedophilia. And, and I must mention this because if you investigate deep enough to understand your enemy, I, I think our brother Patrick talks about war, but you, you know, part of this is understanding the enemy in, in, in Don Su, the art of war. You have to know your enemy, you know yourself, and then you're guaranteed victory. So in analyzing the psychology of the enemy that we're dealing with, as um, our sister Yulia mentioned before, that the, the, the people in Donetsk um, and the people in Mali see are a united force because they think that these this imperialistic enemy, if you want to name him an enemy and to try to understand the psychology of this enemy and the modus operandi of this enemy, the psychology of this enemy is essentially to promote a fiat currency, a fiat monetary system, and a fiat monetary system that essentially enslaves through debt. So if you put this enemy, this enemy just doesn't, he doesn't want you to prosper. You know, let's look at the psychology of what would, who would want to promote a fiat monetary system that essentially means being able to rob the world wealth, and then to sit in castles and emperor and see fellow humanity suffering. I think that, you know, Russia offers another way of resolving conflict through understanding that human beings are essentially a spiritual being. There is a body, there is a mind, and there is a spirit. And acknowledging the spiritual aspect of us and it connecting into nature and natural law, and then understanding that everything then grows out, the body grows out of that spirit and the mind, by extension, grows out of that. You know, it, it, we are not the mind, we have a mind, and we are not a body, but we have a body. And what we are essentially is a soul and, and connected to that soul is the intangible, which is the spirit and quantum mechanics proves these things that consciousness is all in all. Is energy, and and it's quite um, aware of what is happening. And its thought creates geometric patterns, and and so our reality grows out of that. So we can scientifically prove that humanity, we are spiritually, and we are connected through the morphogenic field, um, or or the quantum field, and therefore we cannot think in terms of just the self. We have to think about what is best for the, the greater humanity by extension. So this imperialistic force that we are fighting, it's quite satanic, and it's quite important to state this because it's indeed a fact. Thank you for that, uh, uh, dear Elisa. Thank you for the, the greater insight. Uh, 
Uh, let me come back to you, uh, dear Yulia. Uh, earlier on, we talked about uh, uh, traditional actors who have been actually present on, uh, in Africa. So now, let's bring the perspective of the relationship between the former Soviet Union and the African continent and see, do you think this can provide an alternative to traditional actors' uh, influence? And of course, and as such, we are referring here to Western powers, and and we want also to look at the implications uh, for global geopolitical uh, balance in present day world. Um, well, we see that uh, the situation right now is very much different from um, what it was uh, back in, let's say, 50s and 60s, and uh, you know, in all those times. And we understand that uh, solutions would be different. I mean, the, the whole world is now going through a major transformation and a lot of things will not be the same in five or ten years from now, right? So what is happening right now at the globe is that uh, new uh, models of cooperation, new models of interaction, probably new financial institutions, new global policy institutions, etc., will be... Uh, um, well, they're now being, let's say, elaborated, and very soon we will see um, all of that happening around us, right? So uh, uh, a lot of things will be different, and we can look at the previous experience, you know, draw some, like, conclusions from, from the previous experience, but uh, we cannot, uh, you know, just take it and uh, implement it in different circumstances. Mm -hmm. So the point that I'm making now is that uh, this uh, time we're living in is very, uh, you know, fragile in terms of uh, um, uh, and and very significant for the future. So one, um, let's say, wrong or destructive action can just simply destroy everything. At the same time, you know, laying the foundations for a better future now is as important as probably never before. So we have a unique opportunity to realize our own role, even at the uh, individual level, and understand that uh, to a huge extent the future depends on us. Mm -hmm. So if African business people, um, if African politicians, would be interested to diversify their partnerships and to see what is out there that uh, Russia has to offer, China has to offer. If, uh, you know, Russian people, Russian businessmen, Russian uh, political actors would be uh, reaching out to African continent if they would actually come here, you know, and start communicating, start, uh, you know, working on joint ventures and everything, the future will be uh, much different. Mm -hmm. But it requires, number one, uh, you know, to realize own responsibility for this kind of uh, actions and number two it requires some direct uh, uh, involvement so i think all of the uh, um, let's say uh, all of the necessary uh, lo relevant and logical uh, um, kind of basis it's all there so africa needs uh, uh, to uh, to have a qual to come to a different quality level right uh, to stop just exporting the Roman raw material and to sell products produced in Africa, mm -hmm. to make sure that the value that those products have is compatible and, and African actors set the price for that. Sure. The economy of Africa has an incredible potential. I mean, everything you can possibly think of can be found here. And that value has to define the economic future of Africa, not something else. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Russia has Russia doesn't have any you know, quality experience of like packaging things nicely, promoting them, selling them. Mm -hmm. But Russia has some very simple and durable technologies that it can offer for, you know, joint ventures. You know, uh, I think this uh, cooperation, this uh, polycentric model is uh, the future and we will see it unfolding uh, very soon. Uh, talking about uh, technology, you, you know, uh, how can, because uh, one of uh, problem that has been noticed in Africa is uh, a skills development that is still uh, lagging and of course we want to see where these skills can actually be developed and with uh, the, the fourth industrial revolution and of course with the changing times and changing dynamics uh, uh, we see the need to prepare uh, the human capital so uh, how does the, uh, Russia come in here as far as uh, helping uh, 
maybe uh, exchange of technological expertise uh, that will help uh, boost the skills across uh, maybe in Africa and prepare the young dynamic Africans to transform the Africa like you've said everything is here but we need the expertise we need the technical know-how how to uh, the, 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 uh, maybe the existing relationship how does it or how can it help position uh, these uh, uh, stakeholders or these main actors uh, to better bring Africa to the position that it deserves? You know, um, even while traveling um, uh, across uh, Africa, this one time in some countries I could uh, meet uh, uh, quite a lot of people that uh, have studied in Russia, speak some Russian, but those are, let's say, older uh, generations. And uh, uh, people were uh, traveling to Russia to get some fundamental knowledge in, uh, you know, engineering and um, energy sector and mining because it's also a very complicated area of knowledge and a lot of other things uh, medical um, uh, you know uh, special specialities and medical professions and a lot of other things mm -hmm. but the situation is uh, very different so i think now with the uh, uh, with the communication technology that we have and the internet and so on uh, the format could be different those could be joint projects or you know incoming uh, visiting um, professors and, and speakers and more of exchanges so it can be much more intense uh, than it used to be and anything that I talk about recently related to Russia Africa is mostly about uh, the potential that is out there but that mm -hmm. is not being used Expert not even tech, to yes. the full extent but maybe like 5% mm -hmm. of that is being actually implemented so here just today in Douala uh, we um, had a, a great opportunity to visit uh, some of the um, educational institutions, a university and a college, right? And we could see that uh, um, applied, very applied professions are being taught here. And uh, this is something that can help people to make some very good living because, you know, those applied uh, professions like even mechanics and things you do with Absolutely, your own hands are yeah. very much in demand uh, over here and very much in demand in, in other countries. So, uh, you know, simple things like that do open up a lot of opportunities and then um, we also visited the um, uh, the high-tech uh, university that uh, uh, also sets it clear that the priority right now is to give the best knowledge available to the students and then to make sure that they get some international experience that they get you know some more knowledge come sure. back apply it here and work as entrepreneurs on joint projects I think this model is uh, you know perfect for making sure that the quality of life here on the continent uh, improves rapidly and uh, Africa yeah. is a continent that uh, is rich in you know its people and uh, people that have uh, a very straightforward you know moral and let's say value system people that know what they uh, want in the most cases and a lot of young people and a lot of students so the the uh, the middle class in Africa is rapidly growing the amount of of young people is rapidly growing right mm -hmm, sure. the amount of urban population is rapidly growing and all of those uh, uh, all of those uh, indicators put together just uh, give us a clear point that uh, you know the future is uh, Africa indeed the future is uh, Africa like you said Africa has everything but then Africa seems to be trapped in uh, the uh, uh, geopolitical game that is ongoing and it is time for African stakeholders to be intentional about uh, uh, engaging uh, with uh, any partner and uh, coming back to you we want to look at Africa Russia uh, relationship uh, Mr. Ellis in the sphere of economic uh, uh, cooperation I remember you were one of the people that actually into the Africa uh, Agenda 2040, and uh, we will not uh, forget uh, uh, that the, the quest is to see that Africa triumphs economically, and uh, we, we, we know that uh, the threat uh, in recent years, Russia, Russia has acti uh, actively, I beg your pardon, uh, sought to enhance economic ties with uh, nations across the African country, which has actually boosted the existing trade, investment, and uh, some uh, infrastructure projects. And we know that such a, uh, economic uh, cooperation has the potential, uh, the potential to contribute to Africa 
Africa's development and uh, diversification of trade partners. So now, given uh, the Agenda 2040 uh, that has, has been actually uh, uh, inked, and of course with the present context uh, in Africa, which we see high multilateralism, in your own perspective, what, what are those key uh, factors uh, that need to be put in place at this juncture to solidify the economic uh, uh, partnership between Russia and Africa and of course uh, with the goal or the aim to see uh, much economic buoyancy on the part of Africa. Thank you, beautiful question, thank you. Um, as we approach the Russia-Africa summit, the second um, economic and humanitarian summit, there is a huge opportunity that Russia has to court Africa. And Russia has all to benefit in being a first mover and winning the trust of Mama Africa. As Mama Africa is going to generate um, a bit of steam in terms of its economic growth projections in the coming years and decades as we approach 2040, you are a partner of Africa in creating a win-win situation. You will guarantee prosperity for the Russian economy as well. So there isn't, um, there is nothing to lose for, in terms of um, Russia's move toward courting. And indeed, it's being um, our brother's keeper. You know, our brother Africa has been down for a long time, exploited for a long time. And and so Afri uh, Russia in in extending a hand. In I think uh, we lost uh, Mr. Ellis. You may want to continue uh, answering the question, uh, uh, Mr. Patrick. We are looking at the economic cooperation between uh, Russia and Africa and how uh, these uh, existing ties can further help uh, in uh, the uh, uh, economic trans uh, transformation and diversif uh, diversification of African economies. Uh, un unfortunately, uh, we lost uh, Zuma. Yulia, <laughs> you want to comment on that because that is prime. Um, yes, of course. I think when we talk about um, economic cooperation, we should um, be quite realistic about it, right? So, uh, number one is that there is um, definitely a lot of opportunities. So, uh, um, when you look around, you understand that you know there is always something to work on, something to improve, and you know some of the uh, spheres and areas that are open for um, mutually beneficial cooperation. Mm -hmm. But then uh, uh, when you look at how to establish those uh, ties and how to create those joint projects, there are several dimensions to it. One is clearly uh, you know, the governments and intergovernmental cooperation, of course, uh, additional support coming from the governments and uh, uh, you know, just the um, uh, some of the rules and regulations favorable for business people, the creation of special um, uh, economic zones is, of course, uh, you know, making things uh, much easier. So this is one dimension, let's say, political and legal. Uh, number two is, uh, you know, corporations. And when we talk about those, uh, of course, uh, you know, those are major game changers and things that they're uh, capable of implementing are also major game changers because when you, for instance, talk about energy infrastructure, without this, you cannot create production, you cannot ensure uh, the development of, you know, culture and education and this and that and whatsoever because the uh, at the level of households, you need uh, energy for, you know, a different quality of life. Absolutely. So uh, this is, uh, corporations are moving slowly. They have, uh, you know, their own bureaucracy procedures. Strategic projects are always uh, about many, many years of implementation, but those are major game changers. Right. Then the third dimension is, you know, medium and small businesses that can already enter. We see such examples like, you know, those uh, taxi apps, uh, uh, Russian 
developed ones that uh, you know appear in Cameroon and many other countries or you know IT uh, technologies fintech uh, solutions from Russia that are being implemented here not to mention some of the uh, traditional areas um, education so much more to it so I think that uh, without looking at uh, you know other dimensions each of the actors uh, can just uh, try to go ahead and um, you know implement uh, what they believe is uh, going to be mutually beneficial and realistic okay absolutely uh, mr ellis just uh, rejoined you may want to conclude uh, that statement because we have just uh, five minutes to be together so you may want to round off with uh, your analysis on the economic parts between russia and uh, uh, the african countries Uh, just following on from what Ms. Bird just met, just spoke about. Energy is the lifeblood. Uh, unfortunately, uh, dear Yulia, and of course, uh, with the help of the technician, uh, we are going to talk about uh, the upcoming Russia-Africa summit to be specific. And of course, uh, we, we are lef left with um, maybe less than three weeks uh, uh, to the summit. So what, what do you have to say uh, regarding the summit and what peculiarities, what difference will it be uh, from the, uh, the summit that was held in uh, Sochi? Mm. And of course... Uh, yeah, you see, the second summit, unfortunately, had to go through a lot of difficult circumstances. Absolutely. First, it was supposed to take place in Africa and become an Africa-Russia summit. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there was the pandemic, this and that. Uh, now, with the uh, ongoing uh, you know, conflict, uh, the country is pretty much, uh, in terms of security regulations and everything, is at war. So the summit uh, will be uh, taking place in St. Petersburg, and it will be not four days as uh, initially planned, but two days, two big days. Uh, but at the same time, there is uh, there are tens of side events, cultural and the food festival and music festivals and a lot of that uh, yeah. taking place in St. Petersburg. So there will be a variety of things to choose from. But the summit itself will be um, a bit limited. And another thing is the uh, enormous uh, pressure that uh, African uh, political leaders in the first place and business leaders are facing yeah. due to the summit. So there were events planned in parallel to that to drag them there and to make sure that uh, they do not come to Russia they don't have those direct talks mm -hmm. so my uh, expectations and expectations of many from this particular summit are not uh, you know too much yet at the same time it's a very important step on this path towards each other and um, I don't know if it would be technically possible to demonstrate one of the, uh, you know, one Absolutely. of the uh, visuals and Absolutely, one of the yeah. uh, uh, things that come from the cultural program of the forum that uh, will clearly show the uh, values that are aimed to be promoted and the way we see and understand the future. Uh, that would be a video. Absolutely. Uh, with yeah. the, uh, yeah, it's an absolutely amazing one with mm -hmm. a song written by a good friend of mine who just simply traveled to the Central African Republic and yes. she got so inspired by the vivid and vibrant energy of the continent sure. that she wrote a song and she's a mother of four kids. Okay. She runs a project called uh, Cosmos Holmes an educative project for children mm -hmm. so she wrote a song um, called uh, children of russia children of africa and then a video was created that i think uh, has all the chances to become an unofficial anthem of the uh, russia africa summit and uh, i'm not sure if the uh, because it was just released two days ago so uh, what's going to happen now can be uh, oh. surely called yeah, yeah, a yes, premiere. With the, yeah, with the help of the technician, I think we're going to uh, uh, watch uh, the, the, the song you're talking about, uh, uh, the song dedicated to this second Russia-Africa summit. Yes, and not just the summit, yes, but the uh, the children of the uh, of, of Africa the, of and Africa, children of, of Russia. That right. Yes, I'll just uh, say two more words about uh, the song because I don't think it's a translated version. No, it's so not. it starts off as a, a traditional Russian song mm -hmm. and then the music changes and the lyrics are all about, uh, you know, the values and goals to be promoted. So this would be an all African premiere right now, but then a version with... Uh, English text uh, will also be released. I think it reflects the spirit a lot. 
indeed uh, of course the spirit of togetherness the spirit of family let's uh, get uh, the song uh, that is actually having a lot you know music they say brings peace music of course feeds the souls music makes the people happy with the help of the technician we can listen to this as we round off Please, can we get the song, Joel? Please, can you give uh, more uh, information? Yeah, information regarding this. Uh, uh, yes. Um, uh, once again, uh, the uh, the song itself was written um, uh, after uh, having visited the Central African Republic. But what else is um, interesting about it is that the uh, the video reflects. Uh, the beauty of landscapes and nature of both uh, Africa and Russia. And it talks about the uh, spirit of unity, spirit of love and friendship that uh, we all have uh, as our um, key priorities and motivation for moving forward. So um, children have this pure soul that is all about peace and love and development and creativity and this is something that uh, was intended to be demonstrated uh, in the song using the traditional music using the beauty of nature and using the uh, the purity of uh, you know children's um, aspirations uh, while waiting for the, the, the technician to put everything in order, we, we are going to to continue to uh, to answer uh, these uh, questions. Uh, we are talking about the song that has actually focused more on children. And of course, uh, when we talk about Russia-Africa relations, we also talk about the exchange of culture. And of course, what message is this song going to, you know, the message is already there, but then what impact is it going to, to, to bring hope for an exchange visits between children in Africa and in Russia? And of course, how is this going to actually help yeah. to change the dynamics or the narrative surrounding like racism and other aspects? You know, I think that something that resonates with the soul itself uh, cannot be just, uh, you know, simply uh, forgotten, right? And this song uh, does resonate, I think, with many souls out, out there. So the author of the song, Natalia Vinakurova, she um, runs a project that is uh, created for children to make sure that they're exposed to constructive content, right? Because what we see on YouTube, on TV, and all over the place right now is uh, to a certain extent destructive, promoting uh, violence, uh, promoting some uh, values that are just simply destructive. There is nothing else I can say about it. So it's very important to make sure that the information, the images that uh, children are being exposed to um, help them to, uh, you know, to develop their own potential, help them to uh, uh, stay creative, to, uh, you know, continue dreaming and making their dreams come true. So it's all about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it could have been about, uh, you know, anyone because everyone has some kind of an inner child Absolutely, right uh, yeah. within and that inner child is always about you know love and friendship and just being creative and loving life and that's what uh, uh, we're all here for i assume right to uh, develop to create uh, you know to uh, to cooperate and to make sure that life continues and to make sure that uh, it's um, uh, you know the, the the best it could be in data of course you, you said everyone anyone is invited is it an open invitation for us to be part of this uh, upcoming uh, russia africa summit uh, that will of course want to experience to be able to change the narrative surrounding uh, the, the 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 two uh, let me say the african continent and uh, the former uh, soviet union Yes, well, despite of the, uh, you know, difficult circumstances, mm -hmm. uh, Russia is open for anyone willing to visit. Mm -hmm. And uh, the summit would be a perfect venue to uh, talk about Russia-Africa relations. Yet at the same time, it's necessary to understand that uh, right now there are certain uh, security risks and, um, you know, there are certain 
complicated issues ongoing. Uh, but yeah, sure. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's the best time to uh, um, you know to come and to. Uh, take a look and to have some conversations and to make sure that uh, um, you know joint efforts could uh, uh, could actually bring some fruits to both parties involved. Very imperative. Okay, I think that the the song is ready and let's see yes, what let's it just has enjoy. To, of yes, sure. Thank you. Of course, uh, dear Yulia, one more word before we conclude uh, uh, this uh, program, of course, uh, especially uh, we couldn't understand the language since it's Russian. Uh, it's true you have uh, elaborated more on uh, what uh, the concept of this song. Just one minute before we conclude. Uh, well, um, uh, concluding, the uh, the most important thing that I have to say is that I'm very happy to be here. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an amazing feeling to be here in the studio. And uh, I wanted to share something that some of your uh, viewers might not know, which uh, impressed me deeply, right? So uh, at the very entrance here, uh, at the very gate to a freak media uh, channel, uh, what, uh, what greets you or who greets you first are uh, the the heroes of pan-africanism so over there you can see nelson mandela uh, and uh, nkrumah and uh, patrice lumumba and muammar Gaddafi and everyone yeah. so you know for me uh, that was uh, a very impressive moment so even coming here you know and seeing those faces right at the gate and uh, you know it feels like a very warm uh, welcome generally indeed, speaking indeed. so uh, I would like to uh, yes just express my appreciation to you and the uh, the the entire team of uh, Afrique Media for this uh, uh, not just this warm welcome but for being very consistent with your you know values and uh, for doing what you have been doing so indeed there is need uh, to uh, do what we have been doing because the goal is to see that Africa regains its sovereignty. The goal is to see that Africa takes its exact position. The goal is to see that sovereignty and of course national interest and all stakeholders, especially yeah, political stakeholders in Africa should have a say, especially when it comes to international uh, dynamics or international uh, relations. Thank you so much also for accepting to be with us this day. We are honored, of course, dear Yulia. And I will not forget the two gentlemen uh, 
who joined via Zoom, Mr. Ellis Clinton and uh, Patrick uh, Popel for their great insight on our topic uh, this day, which focused on ties between Russia and Africa, where we actually analyzed the concept of interference and cooperation while taking Russia and Africa as a case study. And I will appreciate the technical crew for ensuring that the program was a success, a success in spite of uh, the small technical uh, issues uh, that we encountered. But of course, it was amazing thank you and please keep trusting the pan-african television for news is always on the move bye-bye